Amen. اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اذكروا نعمة الله عليكم إذ جاءتكم جنود فأرسلنا عليهم ريحا وجنودا لم تروها وكان الله بما تعملون بصيرا إذ جاءوكم من فوقكم ومن أسفل منكم وإذ زاغت الأبصار وبلغت القلوب الحناجر وتظنون بالله الظنونا هنالك ابتلي المؤمنون وزلزلوا زلزالا شديدا وإذ يقول المنافقون والذين في قلوبهم مرض ما وعدنا الله ورسوله إلا غرورا وَإِذْ قَالَ الطَّائِفَةٌ مِّنْهُمْ يَا أَهْلَ يَثْرِبَ لَا مُقَامَ لَكُمْ فَارْجِعُوا وَيَسْتَأْذِنُ فَرِيقٌ مِّنْهُمُ النَّبِيَّ يَقُولُونَ إِنَّ بُيُوتَنَا عَوْرَةٌ وما هي بعورة إن يريدون إلا فرارا ولو دخلت عليهم من أغطارها ثم سئلوا الفتنة لأتوها وما تلبثوا بها إلا يسيرا ولقد كانوا عاهدوا الله من قبل لا يولون الأذبار وكان عهد الله مسؤولا 
قل إن قل لن ينفعكم الفرار إن فررتم من الموت أو القتل وإذا لا تمتعون إلا قليلا قل من ذا الذي يعصمكم من الله إن أراد بكم سوءا أو أراد بكم رحمة ولا يجدون لهم من دون الله وليا ولا نصيرا صدق الله العلي العظيم Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. O oh, you who have faith, remember Allah's blessing upon you when the hosts came at you, and we sent against them a gale and host whom you did not see, and Allah sees best what you do. When, when they came at you from above and below you, and when the eyes rolled with fear, and the hearts leaped to the throats, and you entertained misgivings about Allah, it was there that the faithful were tested and jolted with, with a severe agitation. When the hypocrites, as well as those in whose hearts is a sickness, were saying, Allah and his apostle did not promise us anything except illusion. And when a group of them said, O people of Yathrib, this is not a place for you, so go back. A group of them sought the Prophet's permission to leave the scene of battle, saying, Our homes lie exposed to the enemy, although they were not exposed. They only sought to flee. Had they been invaded from its flanks and had they been asked to apostatize, they would have done so with only a mild hesitation. Though they had already pledged to Allah before that, they would not turn their backs to flee, and pledges given to Allah are accountable. Safe flights will not avail you if you flee from death or from being killed, and then you will be led to enjoy only for a little while. Say, who is it that can protect you from Allah if he desires to cause you harm or desires to grant you his mercy? Besides Allah, they will not find for themselves any protector or helper. Salam. Hey, Kasani, ke iman avardeid. نعمت خدا را بر خود به یاد دارید آنگاه که لشکرهایی به سوی شما در آمدند پس بر سر آنان تندبادی و لشکرهایی که آنها را نمیدیدید فرستادیم و خدا به آنچه می کنید همواره بیناست هنگامی که از بالای سر شما و از زیر پای شما آمدند و آنگاه که چشمها خیره شد و جانها به گلوگاه ها رسید و به خدا گمانهای نابجا می بردید آنجا بود که مؤمنان در آزمایش قرار گرفتند و سخت تکان خوردند و هنگامی که منافقان و کسانی که در دلهایشان بیماری است میگفتند خدا و فرستادش جز فریب به ما وعده ای ندادند و چون گروهی از آنان گفتند ای مردم مدینه دیگر شما را جای درنگ نیست برگردید و گروهی از آنان از پیامبر اجازه میخواستند و میگفتند خانه های ما بیحفاظ است ولی خانه هایشان بیحفاظ نبود آنان جز گریز از جهاد چیزی نمیخواستند و اگر از اطراف مدینه مورد حجوم واقع می شدند 
و آنگاه آنان را به ارتداد میخواندند قطعا آن را میپذیرفتند و جز اندکی در این کار درنگ نمیکردند با آنکه قبلا با خدا سخت پیمان بسته بودند که پشت به دشمن نکنند و پیمان خدا همواره بازخواست دارد بگو اگر از مرگ یا کشته شدن بگریزید هرگز این گریز برای شما سود نمی بخشد و در آن صورت جز اندکی برخوردار نخواهید شد بگو چه کسی می تواند در برابر خدا از شما حمایت کند اگر او بخواهد برای شما بد بیاورد یا بخواهد شما را رحمت کند و غیر از خدا برای خود یار و یاوری نخواهند یافت سلوات سلام علیکم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم Welcome everybody um, uh, We are honored to be here again tonight today tonight this is the night of 24th uh, day of Ramadan and I don't want to take much of your time inshallah we'll uh, continue enjoying from the lectures by our brother uh, Sheikh Hussein Hari please invite him with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق الله أجمعين محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعجل فرجهم Dear respected brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of your amal and good deeds in this blessed month of Ramadan whether it's during the nights of this blessed month or during its days. Inshallah, you all are in the best of health and iman. And inshallah, all of your hawa'aj and wishes and needs from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are granted, especially those that we had asked from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on a night like yesterday, which inshallah was the night of Qadr. Inshallah, all those hawa'aj and needs and wishes of yours are granted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So continuing what we have been doing these nights, which is mentioning some ahkam and some rulings. Tonight's relate to the uh, topic of traveling, especially with regards to uh, breaking the fast or praying qasr, right? Uh, making the uh, four unit prayers into two, right? So some rulings regarding that, inshallah. So firstly, what is the distance that one must pass such that they are considered traveling and the rulings apply to them, such as breaking the fast in certain circumstances or praying qasr. So the ulama mentioned that uh, the distance is uh, between 44 and 46 kilometers. Um, so that's about 27 and a half miles to 29 miles or so. And that is um, either one way or there and back. So for, for example, if some place that you're going to, of course we're going to mention where to start counting from. But let's just say this place is 30 miles away, uh, one way. So that uh, pass, that, that checks the, the, the requirement because it's 30 miles, which is over 44, 46 kilometers, one way. Or no, it could be like, for example, 15 miles. Um, 
but it's a total of 30 miles there and back, so that is considered traveling. So that's the first uh, ruling, which was regards to the actual distance that must be crossed um, so that these ahkam are uh, applying to you. So the second ruling is this, though. When and where does this uh, distance start from? Where do you start counting the distance from, this kilometers or miles? So the ulama mentioned that in smaller or middle-sized cities, they're, they're agreeing on this, which is that uh, in smaller cities or medium-sized cities. Now, what does that actually mean? Perhaps that um, goes back to the, uh, the urf and what is seen as a smaller or medium-sized city in that country, right? So in those cities, you start that, uh, measuring that distance from the last home or the end of the rails of um, that city that you're in, right? So, for example, let's just say uh, the city that you're in, right? You know, once you leave the area... Uh, once you enter a certain uh, place, it's away from the homes, away from the buildings over there, and now it's just like road, for example, right? So that's with smaller and medium cities. You start counting from that. You start measuring from that point, the 44 or 46 kilometers, right? In bigger cities, there's a difference of opinion. Some ulama mention it's the same thing. You do the same thing. Even if it's a larger city, no matter how large it is, uh, you still have to start counting from and measuring from the distance outside of that city. Um, but some ulama say, no, it starts from your area. So let's say, for example, there's a city, um, let's just say that this applies to New York City, for example, where it's a, it's a very large city, such that people see that you know one part of the city is like different from another part. Like you're in one area, and that's another area, and people don't go back and forth between those areas much, right? Let's just, theoretically speaking. Then they say that if that's the case, then you know, you start counting from the end, uh, the borders of the area that you're in within that city, if it's a larger city. Now, that's where you start from. Where does the distance end? Most ulama say that in the beginning of the destination city. So, meaning, let's say, for example, you're going from Baltimore till, uh, what's, another, what's another city? Let's say Baltimore to like, sorry, Silver Spring, let's just say, for example. Um, so, you leave Baltimore. When you leave the area and the, the buildings and the houses, you pass them, you start counting from there until the entrance, the, the, where you actually enter the city of Silver Spring, right? That distance has to cover the 44 kilometers, 46 kilometers, right? That's what most ulama say. However, a small minority say that, no, you count until your actual destination. So wherever it is you're going to inside that city, it's from, where you, it's from the border of the city that you're from, that you're coming from, until the actual destination itself. That's the distance that has to be covered. So that's the second ruling. The third ruling is this, that some people, uh, for example, students travel weekly for school, right? And they come back to their uh, family's home, right? Uh, for the weekends, let's just say. What's the ruling with regards uh, to them? Do they pray full over there? Do they pray qasr? Um, Do they fast? Do they not fast? Most alabat say that um, this person, for example, a student who is traveling back and forth between um, the family's home and the school, uh, they pray full both places, their home and school, and they fast as well, both home and school. And most say that uh, if he happens to want to pray on the way there, right? So in, in the actual journey, Adhan time comes, he wants to pray. Before getting to his destination, most ulama say on the way, he can pray Qasr if he wants to pray. That he has to pray Qasr actually, uh, and pray four rak'ah instead of four rak'ah, two rak'ah. Um, and some say no, that even on the way he prays full. But the majority say that on the way, though, if he wants to pray, then it's um, uh, qasr. That's the third ruling. The fourth ruling is this. This is agreed upon by all ulama. One of the conditions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you permission to break your fast and to pray uh, two rak'ah instead of four is that the travel you're doing is not in it uh, the intention of disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, and alhamdulillah, it's not really a problem, but let's say, for example, somebody's like, I want to go, you know, ziyara of Las Vegas, right? And I want to go over there to casinos or whatever it is. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't give you permission to break your fast. So, if that person is somebody who, even though they're going for gambling, but they still want to pray and, and fast, they're still going to have to over there pray full and, and fast. Because, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who has made this exception, says, I'm not giving you that exception, right? You are disobeying me in this trip, therefore, I'm not giving you permission to break your fast or to pray uh, two instead of four. Like I, all ulama agree on that. The fifth ruling is this, that let's say, for example, you leave home, leave your home at Adhan time. For, let's say, for example, right now, uh, Adhan of Dhuhr was called. I didn't pray yet. And I want to go travel somewhere. I leave without praying at my home and go somewhere far away that passes this distance, right? 
So, is my ruling to pray full or to pray qasr? The answer is that you pray um, based off of uh, where you were at at the end of the time of that prayer. So let's say, for example, the fajr, right? Let's just say, for example, I, uh, fajr adhan is called, and I leave home, and I get to my work after sunrise, or I get to, to no, sorry, not work, because it might be an exception. I get to the place that I'm traveling to after sunrise, and I didn't pray yet, even though fajr is only two rak'ah, right? Or let's say, for example, dhuhr, because it's four. I get there after uh, uh, sunset. The place that I'm at, once it, the time ends, whatever the ruling is over there, that's what you pray. So uh, if you are still in the area and the sunset happened, then you pray. Um, and you're still in your home area, then you pray. You have to make it up praying full. But if you were there and then it became sunset, then you have to pray uh, qasr and you pray two rakah instead of four. And the last question is this, that if somebody is traveling, right, uh, and this is mentioned, by the way, some ask that, is traveling recommended in the month of Ramadan? Or I will not say that it is makruh, it's discouraged before the 23rd of the month of Ramadan. So a day like yesterday, or a day like today, rather. Some of them say the night of the 23rd, some of them say the day of the 23rd. It's discouraged to travel uh, before then. After that, it's not makruh. These next days, it's not uh, discouraged to travel. Um, so, let's say you wanted to travel, and you're fasting, right? When are you allowed to break your fast? It's once you pass that uh, place where it's out of your home area now. So you don't have to wait until you get to the destination. As soon as you leave the area that you're from, it's called Hajj Tarakhus. As soon as you leave that area, then you can break your fast, right? You don't have to wait until you get all the way to your destination to break your fast, per se. So those are some uh, rulings with regards to traveling. Uh, it was a lot, but inshallah, it's a reminder for us all. Inshallah ta'ala. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Sure. Mm. Okay. Uh, you don't have to pray qasr, you mean? So... No, no, yeah, of course. So if you if you leave after if you leave the area after the hud, yes, not you don't have to, you cannot you're not allowed to break your fast in that case. Um, but with regards to prayers, it's still it's still qasr. So if you want to go there and pray, you pray qasr over there. Yeah, um, unless you want to wait until you come back and it's before sunset, then you pray full back at your home. Yes, yes. By nightfall, when do you leave? In the morning? No, because if you're out of your area, if you're out of your area and don't come back before Dhuhr, then, you, then you, yeah, you can't fast. Yeah. If you leave, for example, Fajr, you go somewhere really far, but you come back to your area before Dhuhr Adhan, and you didn't do anything over there to break your fast, you can continue with your fast. Yeah. Yes. It's either one. Either it could be one way, for example, uh, so we don't measure kilometers. Let's say, for example, 30 miles, right? 27 and a half miles, right? Either one way, like I said, for example, the, the place is 30 miles away, that, that checks. Or if it's, no, 15 miles there, 15 miles back, that's also enough. So it's either mulafaqa or it's one way. So it's either together or one way is enough. Yes. Brother, you, you had a question. Okay, no problem at all. صلى على محمد وعلى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد Of course all this talk about travels that means we have to expect some travels these days right we can't mention the ahkam and not apply them أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق الله أجمعين محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعجل فرجه مفرج ربهم يا كريم واللعن الدائم على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين آمين رب العالمين Let us all recite a dua for the safety and wellness and protection of our master, our savior, al-imam al-hujjة ibn al-hasan عجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف We are still in the month of Ramadan where the nights, the days are the best times to be supplicating 
to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and asking Him for our needs and our wishes. And one of the most important hawaj we have is the safety of the Imam of our time, Ajr Allah ta'ala faraja wa sharif. So all together, inshaAllah. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Allahumma kun li waliyika al hujjat ibn al hasan. صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا وجليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين صلوات اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد 82 battles and three wars 82 battles during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and three wars during his Khilafah. Amir al-Mu'mineen Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi was no one and was not a person to shy from battle and to shy from war and to shy from facing the enemies when required. And how could he be when he was the one who said in a famous letter of his, وَالَّذِي نَفْسُ عَلِيًّا بِيَدِهِ وَالَّذِي نَفْسُ بْنَ أَبِي طَالِبٍ بِيَدِهِ Had, by the one he swears, by the one in whose hands the soul of Ali ibn Abi Talib is, if all the Arabs, لَوْ تَضَافَرَتَ الْعَرَبُ عَلَىٰ قِتَالِ لَمَا وَلَّيْتُ عَنْهَا If all of the Arabs were to gather and wage war against me, I would, have, I would not run away from this war. And would not run away from this battle. Amir al-Mu'mineen, salam Allah ta'ala alayhi, he's the one who says, that wallahi labnu abi talib anasu bil mawt min al-tifli bithadhi ummah that the son of abu talib meaning himself he loves death and he is more interested in death than the nursing child is with regards to the breasts of their mother meaning how much does a child love right and, and, and have that connection with their mother the imam says that death to me and shahada is more beloved. It's more attractive to me than that. Amir al-Mu'mini salam Allah ta'ala so many stories, so many times in his life where his bravery was shown, and it's something that I don't even have to mention. It's, some, it's one of those things where uh, one of the ulama says that the fada'il and the virtues of the Imam sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even though the enemies would hide them out of their hatred towards him and jealousy and envy, and his followers would hide them because they were afraid that they would be attacked and they would be treated differently because of their love towards the Imam. Even with that, مَلَأَتْ فَضَائِلُهُ مَا بَيْنَ الْخَافِقَيْنَ That the fada'il and the virtues of the Imam has filled the world, right? That wherever you go, in the Muslim Ummah, and whatever book you read, you see the fada'il of Amir al-Mu'mineen, salam Allah ta'ala alayhi. Even though the enemies were hiding his fada'il and virtues for one reason, and even his followers for another reason. So his bravery is not something that is uh, not talked about for us, something that is, we have to establish or try and, and shed light on as if it's something new to us. Now, that's the case. But there's a question which is, was the bravery, bravery of Amir al-Mu'mineen, salam Allah ta'ala alayhi, only shown in the battlefield? Or is bravery more than just fighting and waging war and attacking enemies with the sword? And this is a topic, inshallah, for tonight, which is one of the characteristics of a Muslim and a follower of Amir al-Mu'mineen, salam Allah ta'ala alayhi, is that he or she is courageous, he or she is a brave person. Now, when we want to know what bravery actually is, we go and look at what the Qur'an says, what the Prophet says, and what the Ahl al-Bayt alayhi salatu salam say. To summarize, before we get into some narrations, it is that courageous, uh, courage and bravery is that strength inside you that allows you to do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from you and to not back away from it as difficult as it may be. 
That's to put it short, right? One day it means going out for battle and jihad. One day it means when you're put in a situation between haram and halal, the brave thing to do is to hold yourself back and not engage in haram, right? One day it means that when you're triggered by somebody to, to get angry, right, and somebody tests your, tests your patience, bravery is to hold yourself back, right? Bravery is that on those cold nights of winter when you're under the blanket and you're so comfortable in your bed and the call to prayer is made that you're strong enough to get yourself out of bed and to go pray the Fajr prayer. That's what bravery is. Whatever situation you're in, it's that strength inside you that allows you to do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from you. And of course, as you mentioned, one of the ways that this was shown in the life of the Imam was in battle. But there are other examples as well. So, that's the summary of what courage and bravery actually is, according to Islam. Some words of the Imam on this, in which he says, the bravery and courage of somebody is measured by the amount of himma and willpower they have. Meaning, how strong are you in getting yourself to do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from you to do? How easy or difficult is it for you to get out of bed to pray Fajr, for example, or to stay away from that haram look? Depending on how strong your willpower is, that's how brave or, God forbid, not brave you are. That's one narration. So willpower. He doesn't say it's how big your muscles are. Not necessarily. Somebody may have the biggest of muscles, but is a coward. Right? And I'm sure you guys can think of some examples. One of them is this. Uh, the Imam Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has been narrated. He says, الشَّجَاعَةُ sabru سَعَى Bravery and courage is to observe patience for an amount of time. Meaning that when you're in a situation where you're being tested, it's that ability to hold yourself back. It's a few moments, but not everybody has that bravery. Right? That haram, sometimes, all it takes is a few seconds to do. But even though it's a few seconds, it's still difficult. Only the brave person is able to hold himself back from engaging in haram, God forbid. One of the hadith says, أَشْجَعَةُ أَوْ أَشْجَعُ النَّاسِ أَسْخَاهُمْ One of the most brave, or the most brave and courageous of people is the most generous of them. The question is, what's the relation between bravery and generosity? This is a, a good point over here, al That the explanation is this, that somebody who has their wealth, right, has their properties, has their belongings, right, giving is not something easy. In fact, one of the uh, tests uh, and one of the, p the wisdoms behind sadaqah and khums and zakat is exactly that, to test our willpower and obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when it comes to things that are really dear to us, such as wealth. And so only somebody who has that trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, only somebody who, has, who does not have a fear of, oh, if I give for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm going to lose and that this is my wealth, and I worked so hard for it, and I don't want to lose it. They have that fear of losing their wealth when giving in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only a brave person in that situation will be able to give and will be able to uh, help those in need, for example. One hadith says, أَشْجَعُ النَّاسِ مَنْ غَلَبَ الْجَهْلَ بِالْحِلْمِ The most brave of people is not the person who flexes their muscles the most when they're in an altercation. Rather, the Imam says the most brave of people is the one who is able to overcome ignorance from others towards him with hilm and with patience and with forbearance. Meaning what? That this person, I know what he's doing, comes from jahl. He doesn't know any better. Or maybe he is somebody who is purposely, purposefully um, not using his intellect, not using his aql, right? But the question is how am I going to deal with that jahl of his? that mistreatment of his, the brave person, the Imam says, is somebody who is able to return that jahil and mistreatment with hal and forbearance. So, shaja'ah and bravery is not just that. It's not just flexing your muscles, it's not just being able to fight in the wars, right? And, um, and, and to do those physical, uh, physically uh, difficult uh, tasks. And that's a bit about what bravery actually is. Now, the Imams have also mentioned some things about what bravery is not. One hadith says, the Imam Amir al-Mumani says, Aafatu al-Qawi istidhaafu al-Khasm. You see, there's one story 
this is an example of when somebody is strong physically perhaps, they get uh, arrogant. They start to think they're everything. There's this one story mentioned by the ulama that this one man was a very you know, muscular bodybuilder, somebody very strong in, in apparent senses, right? And he would be you know, in, in wrestling matches perhaps, and he's, he's wrestling the other strong opponents, right? And he just keeps winning and winning. He has a winning streak. So he gets so arrogant to the point where he says, Ya Allah, all these humans, I've been able to fight them and I beat them in, in wrestling matches, right? Send down Jibrail, I want to fight him. Send down your angel Jibrail because humans are not enough. I want to fight your angel, right? Jibrail, who we know is, you know, uh, some uh, strong, one of the strongest angels. So this is how he started to think, right? Because he thought this is, you know, let's say he's everything now. He's, un he's unmatched. And so subhanAllah, uh, the story mentions that Within days, this man fell ill, and he was uh, in bed, and he couldn't get out of bed from this illness, and he was at home. And a man came to visit him at that, mo at that point, and he's speaking to him, saying, how are you doing, right, everything, inshallah, everything is well, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you patience. He says, you know, he's con conversing with him, and so he asks him, says, you know, oh, so-and-so, who has come to visit him, could you check my foot? I feel this sense of itching, tingling, something there. And so the man does, and he sees that there's a mouse eating at the dead skin of this man's foot, right? This man, and he couldn't, he couldn't, he couldn't even move his foot, or he couldn't get up to even move that mouse out of the way. This person who just thought that he wanted, he's just calling Jibrail to come and fight him and to wrestle him, right? This is how he ended up being. This is a sign from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the imam says that something that a true uh, brave person and courageous person does is that they do not get arrogant and start to see the enemy as very weak and as uh, not being um, strong by any means, not being something to worry about. And where does that come to play? It comes to play in, in, in war for sure, right? Where one of the biggest mistakes is you underestimate your enemy and your opponent for sure and that uh, that might be the cause of you losing a battle and maybe even losing the war. And that's the case with these physical wars, but it's the case as well today, where by all means we are in battle, right? With different uh, ideologies, with different ways of life. And one of the worst things we can do is to think that the enemy and that the opponents are weak and that they don't have anything and that we have nothing to worry about, Allah is on our side. It's true. Allah is on the side of the Muslims. Allah is on the side of the believers. But that doesn't mean they don't do anything to defend themselves. That the hadith of the Imam says, If you want to you know, lie in slumber and fall asleep and not be aware of what the enemies are doing, the enemies are awake. They're wide awake. And they're working. Don't think they're not working, right? And you can look anywhere in society, anywhere in our life today, you can see the, the, the effects of their work, right? From YouTube videos to cartoons to laws that are being um, passed, right, in the government, right? Wherever you look, you see the enemy working. So the Imam says that even if you see yourself as having some strength, some courage, some bravery, never underestimate the enemy. And that it's in war as well as in, that's in physical war as well as in ideological war, which is something that we're in today. So that's one thing a brave and courageous person doesn't do, no matter how strong they see themselves as. Another one is this. And Imam al-Hasan al-Azkari says, إِنَّ لِلشَّجَاعَةِ مِقْدَارَ Shaja'a, courage, bravery, has a limit to it. What is that limit, Ibn Rasulullah? فَإِنْ زَادَ عَلَيْهِ فَهُوَ تَهَوَّرَ If you pass that limit of, and that, uh, the limit of, of, of courage and bravery, it becomes carelessness. Meaning that, Yes, some situations you have to, by all means, try your best to accomplish and to go about whatever endeavor you are faced with. But sometimes, you might get arrogant and start to act careless. And somebody asks you, what are you doing? You say, no, I'm brave, I can do it, I'm strong enough. No, it's not that. It's that you have to read the situation. You have to know when this is a time to advance and when it's not. That when, if you involve yourself in this, you're going to harm yourself or benefit yourself, or harm others, God forbid, uh, or you know, benefit others. So, tahawwur, carelessness, is if you go too much on the bravery and courage side. It's not bravery anymore. It's you being reckless, being careless. 
So courage and bravery is something that we have to observe and uh, it's, it's necessary in our lives. We'll talk about some tips how to strengthen that inshallah ta'ala. But two reasons why it's necessary. One, because life puts us in many situations which require the strength and willpower to hold back or advance. Life and this dunya, this is how it is, right? We're mentioning some of the reality of the dunya yesterday with regards to being patient with loss, being patient with difficulties. And same thing with courage and bravery, right? Somebody who is not courageous, somebody who doesn't have the willpower to advance and go ahead and doing what's necessary, what's, what's uh, uh, requ required from them in such, a in, in such a situation, they won't advance. Same thing with staying away from what they should be staying away from. So that willpower is definitely necessary and something we need to work on. Second thing is this, not only is it necessary to, to survive and to get by, but to succeed both in this world and in the afterlife, you need to have courage. Ask or look at the lives of all successful people, right? Most of them, they took risks, that they did things and they were at times in their life where things were not looking good, right? And they made big moves that had risk behind them, right? But that's what it requires sometimes to succeed. That's what it requires sometimes to thrive, to flourish, is that you're willing to take that big step, you're willing to, take, uh, to, to make that uh, advance, that things look risky, right? Of course, you have to sit down and study the situation, of course, whether it's investing money, whether it's moving to a certain place, looking into a certain job, whatever it is, of course. But if you're always going to be holding yourself back with that fear, I'm afraid it's not going to happen, I'm afraid it's, it's going to go wrong, right? You're not going to advance most likely in life. You're not going to succeed, let alone thrive and flourish. So that's a bit on bravery, what it is, what it means, and why it's necessary. Amir al-Mu'maneen, sallallahu alayhi was the embodiment of bravery as he was with the embodiment of all of these different traits that we have mentioned in the previous nights. A bit on his bravery, inshallah, before we get to practical steps. Sallallahu alayhi Muhammad wa alayhi Muhammad. Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu ta'ala alayhi was very known for his bravery. Everybody knew this. And even until now, the, except for those who are um, careless about the Ahl al-Bayt or who are being lied to and are having things covered up to them, everybody is aware of the, braveness, or the, the bravery of Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu ta'ala alayhi such that one of the words that Lady Zahra sallallahu alayhi mentioned in her khutbah is the bravery of the Imam sallallahu alayhi wa she says that whenever fitan would emerge, whenever difficulties would emerge, whenever the enemies would be uh, advancing to attack the Muslims, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, she says, would take Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu ta'ala alayhi and qadhafa akha'ahu fi lahawatiha. That whenever there was difficulties or enemies or risk towards the Muslims, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, as she mentioned, would take Amir al-Mu'mineen and throw him into the, the, the deep, right? The danger zone. Right? Throw him into the war. So he would not leave battle until he extinguishes the fitna and until he gets rid of the problem that the Muslims are being faced with. Now, why did the Imam, how was he able to do that? Lady Zahra السلام, continues and said, and says, مَكْدُودًا فِي ذَاتِ اللَّهِ why? Because the Imam was so invested in worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning he didn't see that this is what I want and this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants. Whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from me, I'm going to go ahead and advance and do that. That's it. Even though everything looks to be against, all odds look to be against you, right? And of course, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we know that he's the master of planning, the master of tactics. But where in time that the Muslims were all afraid to advance, as we'll mention in the story of Khandaq, and nobody wanted to do the job, Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the one rushing to battle, the one rushing to uh, problems and difficulties. But with the intention of saving the Muslims and putting an end to this fitna and this trouble. Sayyidu awliya Allah. He is the master, he was the, the master of the awliya and beloved ones to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Imam sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, also mentions this as we mentioned, which is that he says that if all of the Arabs were to attack me, 
If, then I wouldn't back away from battle. One story, which is the story of Khandaq, which we have requested from the uh, respected brother to recite the ayahs from in Surah Al-Ahzab. The battle of Ahzab or Khandaq was perhaps one of the most difficult battles of the Muslims during the time of the Prophet Such that the Quran says, وَأَذْزَاغَتِ الْأَبْصَارِ وَبَلَغَتِ الْقُلُوبُ الْحَنَاجِرِ وَتَظُنُّونَ بِاللَّهِ الظُّنُونَ هُنَالِكَ ابْتُلِيَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَزُلْزِلُوا زِلْزَالًا شَدِيدًا In the battle of Ahzab, زَاغَتِ الْأَبْصَارِ People started to look left and right. They started to think, we're done, right? The Muslims, the Muslims. They were thinking that, مَا وَعَدَنَا اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ إِلَّا غُرُورًا Rasulullah promised us uh, success, promised us to conquer these lands, right, to defeat the mushrikeen. It was all a lie. Everything he mentioned was a lie. This is what the munafiqeen and those who had the illness in their hearts were saying. And not only that, the Quran says, هُنَالِكَ ابْتُلِيَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ Not just the munafiqeen were tested. Of course, they, they, were, they were gone from the beginning. The mu'mineen, the believers were tested on the battle of Khandaq. بَلَغَتِ الْقُلُوبُ hanajar. I don't know if you guys have ex- experienced this, but the Quran says that they were in such a situation, the Muslims, that it's like their hearts had entered their throats. That they were so afraid of what was going to happen and of the Muslims being wiped off the face of the earth and the mushrikeen and polytheists conquering, right? That's what they were afraid of. They were shaken to their core. They were tested in the Battle of Khandaq. Now, who was the hero of the Battle of Khandaq? As we all know, our master, Amir al-Mu'mineen, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. So the story goes, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. The story is that this is one of the battles where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa took a defensive uh, approach because the mushrikeen and the uh, polytheists in Quraysh had been uh, advancing towards the Muslims and they had to be in the defensive, uh, in the defensive position at that point. And so the story goes that he was seeking advice from the, the companions until Salman and Muhammadi ta'ala, gave the advice that, you know, back home we would uh, dig trenches to kind of guard us from the enemies if we were in such situations. And so it was. And in that story, actually, that's when the famous uh, hadith was mentioned, which is that uh, after Salman brought this idea and mentioned it to Rasulullah sallallahu everybody wanted to claim him, right? And say that Salman's one of us, Salman's one of us. Rasulullah says, Salman and minna ahl al-bayt. That Salman is one of us ahl al-bayt, salawatullahi alayhi wa ajma'in. So, they built a trench, and it was effective. They, they dug the trench, and it was effective until, and only, only until, until this enemy, enemy came and crossed, and that was, of course, Amr ibn Abdul al-Amri. The one who was compared to 1,000 warriors at his time. And that actually happened, and, and the histor- story mentions that in certain situations, uh, he was faced by a thousand and he was able to, uh, to scare them all off and scare many of them off as well as actually uh, injure and, and kill some of them, right? So a thousand to one, this is how the man was. So he passes the trench and now he's on the Muslim side. Okay. And so now he starts to call out. And this is a tactic that, uh, that is used today even. And he says to them, Ala rajulun yabruz. Is there no man from among you to come out and fight me? Where is that Jannah that you guys think that if you're going to be killed, you're going to enter, right? If you want to go to Jannah, come, I'm going to send you to Jannah. Come here, come here. You want to go to heaven, I'll send you right there. And so the hadith says that the Muslims were like as if birds were on their heads. So, for example, you might have, uh, have experienced this where there's like, a, for example, a butterfly or a bug or even a bird. Uh, on your body, you stay still, such that the bird isn't scared, you know, and flies away, right? The hadith says that that's how the Muslims were. Nobody wanted to make a move. One of the opinions is that lest the Rasulullah says, oh, you want to go? Go ahead. As if birds were on their heads. Who's the one man that stood up and said, me, ya Rasulullah? Amir al-Mumineen, salam Allah ta'ala, ana lahu ya Rasulullah. The hadith says, Rasulullah said to him, nujlus ya Ali, fa'innahu amr. Ya Ali, I know you want to go, but this is Amr ibn Abdul. It's not somebody easy. So again, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam calls out, who will go and fight Amr? And I will guarantee heaven for them. Not only do you have the enemy saying, come, I'll send you to heaven. Rasulullah himself says, if you go, and if you are sent to the Akhirah, you're going to go to heaven. I guarantee it. Rasulullah is getting them, uh, not even a get out of jail free card, but go and enter heaven free card, right? 
All it takes is a few minutes, uh, maybe not even a few minutes, and then they're going to be sent to the other world. And again, Amir Muni said, I'm Allah Ta'ala. And he gets up and he says, Ana lahu ya Rasulullah. The, the Rasulullah says to him, Ajlus ya Ali, innahu Amr. This is Amr, and he's, he's not somebody to be taken lightly. And the narrations say that Amr ibn Adwit is also taunting them even more and more. So he says, Ala rajun yabra. There's no man to come out and fight. Ya Muhammad, ukhruj ilay. Muhammad, you're the one who's the, the, the commander of this army. Come and fight me, right? Come and fight me yourself. And the wisdom which is about why Rasulullah himself didn't go out and fight, requires a lot of talk. One of the wisdoms is that to show the Muslims Amir al-Mu'mineen salam Allah ta'ala in his position. That's one of them. One of the wisdoms. And he keeps taunting them. Third time he gets up, Amir al-Mu'mineen salam Allah ta'ala But before that, Amr ibn Adwa starts reciting poetry. And he says that I am calling out over here, calling for one of you to come and fight. وَلَقَدْ بُحَحْتُ بِجَمْعِكُمْ هَذَا my, my, my voice is gone from how much I'm calling you guys to come fight. Is there nobody? Amir al-Mu'min salam Allah ta'ala gets up. He says to him, أَنَا لَهُ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ Amir al-Mu'min says, يَا عَلِي uh, Rasul Allah says, يَا عَلِي إِنَّهُ عَمْرِ Amir al-Mu'min salam Allah ta'ala He says, وَأَنَا عَلِي اللهم صلى على محمد وعلى محمد He is Amr ibn Abdul of course, but I am Ali ibn Abi Talib. I'm also not somebody. Now, why did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa not allow him to go the first time? One of the reasons as well is this, is that so the Muslims don't have an excuse later on, say, oh, we wanted to go, but Ali was, he rushed and he didn't allow us to go, right? The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa gave them some time, gave them opportunity, and nobody went. Of course, Amir al-Mumin sallallahu alayhi wa was there volunteering from the very beginning. And so he goes and starts reciting poetry, says, don't, don't rush, don't rush. You want to you wanna have somebody fight you? Don't rush. I'm, I'm coming, I'm coming, don't worry. And this is the Amir al-Mu'mineen, salam Allah ta'ala alayhi. As, as one hadith says, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in one battle was saying, Aina dar'i, aina sayfi, where's my sword, where's my shield? They say, Ya Rasulullah, you're holding your sword, you're holding your shield. They say, no, where is Ali? Amir al-Mu'mineen, salam Allah alayhi was the sword and the shield of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He says, don't come, D- don't worry, I'm coming, I'm coming for you. So, that is when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa the hadith says, takes his amama, his turban, takes it off from his head and puts it on the head of Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu alayhi wa ta'ala alayhi. And as he's going, Rasulullah says the famous words, kharaj al-iman kulluh ila shirk kulluh. Or baraz al-iman kulluh ila shirk kulluh. Iman itself, we mentioned this before, Iman itself has gone to fight. Iman is an entirety and faith in its entirety has gone to face, face, uh, face disbelief and shirk in its entirety. Amir al-Mu'mineen salam Allah ta'ala alayhi is not only the master of the believers, he is belief, he is iman. So, Amr says to him that your cousin, Rasulullah, oh, he doesn't call him Rasulullah, so he says, your cousin, was he not afraid that when he sends you out here to fight, that I'm going to lift you with my sword and put you between the ground and the sky such that you won't be dead or alive? He's taunting him, right? He says, Amir al-Mu'mineen salam Allah ta'ala alayhi, says to him that my cousin, Rasulullah, knows that if I were to come out here and kill you, you'd be entering hell and I'd be entering heaven because of this. And if you were to kill me, same thing. You'd be entering the hellfire and I'd ent- being, uh, enter into heaven for my, uh, for my battle. And so he says to him that, you know, this is tilka idhan qismatun liza, right? You can't have both, right? You want, if you get killed, you're going to go to heaven and if you, don't, and if you kill, you're going to go to heaven. I mean, when we says to him, okay, you have two options, you have three options I'm going to give you. I've heard that you uh, were never faced with somebody that gave you two options except that you, you know, accepted one of them. The first one is this, become a Muslim, and we won't have a fight, and everything will be good, and we'll become friends and everything. He says that, that's not the case, I'm not going to do that, right? And surrender to the enemy, what will the people say about that? This is okay. The second request is this, that you're on a horse, I want you to come down and let us, let us fight without our, our horses. He says, okay. The second one I'll do. So Amr gets off the horse, and he cuts the legs of the horse, meaning that's it. One hadith says he cuts the legs of the horse, another one says he hid it to go and to run away and leave him. Then he says to him that, what's your name? He says, I'm Ali. Amr says to him. He says, Ibn Man, Ibn Abd Manaf. He says, Ibn Abi Talib. He says, your father was a friend of mine, right? I don't want to kill the son of my friend, he says, yes, but I want to kill you. That's Amir al-Mumini, salam Allah ta'ala. He says, okay. And so, long story short, 
The battle starts, the hadith says that Amr ibn Abdul lifts his sword and he hits the Imam sallallahu The Imam has some kind of shield and the hadith says that the uh, sword went through the shield and hit the Imam on his head. After that, the hadith says that Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu alayhi one blow to right here on his, uh, next to his shoulder, Amr ibn Abdul falls to the ground. The Muslims say that we saw dust come up in the sky all of a sudden, we see that Amir al-Mu'mineen salam Allah ta'ala alayhi is sitting on the chest of Amr ibn Abdul al-Amri. And the Muslims all start saying takbir, right? So they weren't there to be the brave one, but they're saying, you know, they're clapping, they're cheering for the Imam sallallahu alayhi wa sallam alayhi. And in that hadith, that uh, if, if it's correct, which is that Amr ibn Abdul, he disrespects the Imam sallallahu alayhi wa sallam alayhi. The hadith says that he actually spat in his face. And so the Imam gets up and he goes, takes a circle and comes back and he ends Amr ibn Abdul. The Muslims asked Rasulullah, why did he do that? He says, ask him. Ask him, why did he do that? And so they did and said, Ya Ali, what's the reason that you didn't kill him right there? He says that, I wanted to make sure my intentions were pure. And that when ending Amr ibn Abdul, who's an enemy of Islam by all means, but that when I do it, it's 100% for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hence the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi in which he says, ضَرْبَةُ عَلِيًّ يَوْمَ الْخَنْدَقْ أَفْضَلُ مِنْ عِبَادَةِ الثَّقَلَيْنِ That one blow from the sword of Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi has more thawab and reward than the ibadah and worship of both mankind and jinn. One of the reasons is this, it was only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi was no one to back away from war, to back away from situations in which he was tested, and he was the epitome of courage and bravery, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So we wish to learn from the bravery of the Imam, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi, some pieces of advice, and inshallah, we will end for tonight. One of them is this, that if you want to strengthen that courage and bravery in yourself, it's to start off with faking it until you make it, as they say, right? Constantly mention to yourself that I am brave and I'm trying to be brave. The hadith says, لَمْ تَكُنْ حَلِيمًا فتحلم. If you're not somebody who is uh, patient, somebody who has forbearance, then speak to yourself as if you are. Tell yourself that I'm patient, I'm somebody who is uh, brave, I'm somebody who is courageous, until you actually start to, to believe that and actually embody that. That's the first tip. The second one is this. Before trying to take on a big thing, take small steps towards it. Right? If you're afraid of taking a big step in life, try and take steps bit by bit before taking this big uh, endeavor head on, right? Such that when that time comes and when that uh, step that you want to take comes, you're prepared yourself for it. So take things step by step if possible. The third one is this, understanding the reality of things that you fear and that they most likely aren't worth fearing. The Imam Sallallahu says in a hadith, and nasu a'da'u ma jahilu that often things that we're afraid of, we're not actually aware of them, right? Such that if we knew the reality of them, we wouldn't be afraid. So for example, uh, and I'm sure you all can attest to this, right? Um, let's say for example, uh, there's some kind of, um, you know, a needle somebody's afraid of, right, taking in, in, the, in the hospital, right, or an injection or something. Uh, or for example, um, the dark even, right? The dark often, it's, it's, it's not the dark that's really a problem, right? It's just that you, you're speaking to yourself and saying that there's something there that I don't know, right? But if you understand the reality, this is just the same room that you're in, but now there's no lights, right? So some things that you make them bigger than they actually are in your mind. So trying to understand the reality of the thing that you're afraid of, and that'll make uh, advancing towards it easier, inshallah ta'ala. The fourth one is this, to always have hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he truly is the one able to benefit and harm you, meaning everything in his, is in his hands. Have to work on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no matter how much you try to plan things, to avoid dangers, to drag and bring benefit to yourself, right? Ultimately, everything is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So doing what you can, you place your reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and trust in him. Fifthly, Always keep in mind you're a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and therefore must always obey him. So if you are in a situation where you're between uh, uh, disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and obeying him, realize that this disobedience 
it will only harm you, right? And that as difficult as it may be to avoid it, if you do so, it will only benefit you. It's keeping that in mind, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only wants the best for you, and that He knows what's best for you and what's not good for you, that inshallah that will help um, uh, easing the advancement of doing what you should do and avoiding what you should avoid. A sixth one is this, um, having positive and supportive friends. So if you have friends that are nothing but negativity, nothing but, oh, don't do that, and stay in your life, and, and the, the same thing that you're used to doing, keep doing that, right? Afraid of, of trying new things, afraid of change, that will have its effects on you. So try to be with supportive, positive people. Another one is keep in mind that it's usually just that one first step that you have to take before you realize that it's not all that, right? So you only need to be brave for a few seconds, for a minute, right? And to try that new thing, and after that, it'll become easier. And of course, with all that in mind, keeping your reliance and tawakkul on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us with the bravery and courage that we need to be successful in this world and in the afterlife, inshallah ta'ala, by the haqq and right of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib, salawatullahi salamu alayhi, and by the barakat of these nights of the month of Ramadan, and with the blessings and du'as of the Imam of our time, ajalallahu ta'ala farajur sharif, before we wrap up, we will say a dua for his safety, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Allahumma kun li walikal hujjat ibn al Hassan. Salawatuka alayhi wa ala abaim. Fi hadhihi sa'aim. وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وصل اللهم على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل الفرق